So I'm trying to tell the story of the West encounter with Islam and uh, uh, with, with the West encounter with Islam through the angle of music and black internationalism. Uh, the origins of this book, um, over a decade ago in the early 2000s, I used to work as a journalist. I was a cultural reporter writing for uh, different magazines, The New African and, and so on. Based in Harlem, writing about youth culture, gentrification, globalization in Harlem. Right, and I was interested. I was also involved in music. I used to DJ. I always say uh, I never achieved DJ Bassam Bassam Haddad's level of fame, but not for not trying. So I was involved in music. And I was working as a darn journalist and just watching sort of globalization taking place in Harlem. People coming in from around the world, sort of artists, dancers, rappers, tourists coming in from different parts of the world to Harlem, going up to the Bronx, going to different hip hop uh, park jams. I mean, it's a pilgrimage of sorts, right? And I've just started thinking about the role of the Bronx and Harlem in global youth culture. Uh, this is also the post 9-11 years, the crackdown on Muslim communities in Europe and America, and of course in New York, uh, we were at the center of that. And so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd write about sort of how, how are Muslim youth, how are Muslim communities responding? What is their cultural and political response uh, to all these, to this range of punitive policies that's being directed at them? Um, and so in the book, I describe sort of a range of movements, right? I look at Islamist secular movements. I look at um, uh, separatist integrationist movements that have appeared over the last 10, 15 years in, in, in global cities, in European cities, in American urban centers as well. But I'm particularly interested in the turn towards race activism, in the turn towards black politics. Uh, in many ways, I say that 9-11 was the Muslim community's uh, racial baptism, right? Suddenly, you know, uh, the Lebanese and the Egyptians and the Pakistanis and so on suddenly realize that, you know, why wow, we're a minority, we're a racial minority, and we need to mobilize. Um, so I talk about there's a very keen interest. I, I talk about sort of the turn towards race activism and and black internationalism that you've seen among Muslim youth. There's a great deal of interest among Muslim youth today in Fanon, Malcolm X, and Césaire, and other figures of the black struggle. As I write in the intro. Muslims in the last decade have discovered race as a political tool. Black internationalism increasingly provides an archive from which young Muslims in Europe and, US, US, and the US can draw on, unquote. So I make several sort of general arguments. Um, the book is in some ways a response to Olivier Roy, the French scholar who wrote a book in 2004 uh, called Global Islam, Globalizing Islam. And it's sort of one of the it's one of the first books to look at Muslim youth culture at a, at a transnational level. And he made the argument that with the end of the Cold War, <clears throat> with the end of the Cold War, he says the only alternative left to young progressives, to aspiring radical leftists, right? With the end of the Cold War, the collapse of communism, political Islam is the only sort of progressive alternative left today. Um, uh, it's the only radical or international protest movement available to uh, uh, young progressives, right? And he, he speaks specifically about what he calls neo-fundamentalism, which is his term for the Salafi movement. And an argument in the book, I say that's actually not quite true, right? Uh, there is another progressive alternative, and that is the Black Freedom Movement, right? So the range of movements that have emerged in the African diaspora over, over the last uh, four or five centuries. Um, and I try to show in the book sort of the different kinds of movements and groups that have been inspired by uh, black diaspora politics. I talk about the black powerite movements that have emerged in Belgium, France. I talk about the <coughs> Black Panther movement that you have in Greece, in Sweden, mostly Muslim and black uh, immigrants and the children of immigrants leading these groups. So that's the first, one of the first things I look at. I also look at, um, again, this interest um, in black Atlantic history uh, that Muslim youth have, have developed over the last decade. Uh, the Black Atlantic Archive, as I call it, is attractive to Muslim youth, not only because it's the oldest, it, 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 it contains the oldest Muslim presence in the West, so the history of Muslim slaves in Brazil, Trinidad, and the American South, but also because of its progressivism, right? So that Black internationalism is attractive because of its progressivism and radicalism. Um, if you look at the Muslim political landscape today, Muslim political landscape today is dominated by the right, right? You have the center right, you have groups such as the Muslim Brotherhood or Bili Gurush, we're talking about. The far right, you have Salafi movements. If you're a young liberal, young liberal Muslims will gravitate towards Sufi Muslims. But if you see yourself as a progressive or a leftist and you're interested in race and gender, uh, uh, gender inequality, gender equality, and anti-imperialism, where do you go as a young Muslim? 
What I say is you're seeing sort of a gravitation towards uh, race activism or black politics. The Black Archive, the Black Atlantic Archive, fills a political void that exists uh, in Muslim diaspora politics today. Um, so I use music in the book, uh, sort of the geographic position I take. I've lived in Harlem and the Bronx for the last 20 years, so I take a position sort of in the urban periphery, looking at all these encounters from the point of view of, of the ghetto, of uh, the urban periphery, and also use music as a lens to get at all these movements, at these, at these engagements. Why music? Well, as you all know, music has long been used by youth around the world for protest, to mobilize, to proclaim their identity, and so on. But also, music disseminates black politics and black culture. It is through music that Muslim youth in Turkey, Pakistan, Ghana find out about Garveyism and Malcolm and so on. And I'm hardly the first to note this. Uh, jazz, uh, jazz historian Albert Murray, novelist uh, James Baldwin have written extensively about the role of music in disseminating black history, the role of music in representing black history. Finally, there are intense debates taking place within Muslim communities about whether music is permissible or not, haram or, or halal. And policymakers are watching these debates. They're listening carefully to the music coming out of Muslim diaspora communities. And within, uh, among state officials, there's sort of an argument is developed that I'll be talking about that you can distinguish between moderate and radical Muslim depending on their attitudes to music. Right, so, if it's music, so the attitude towards music has become a lifestyle criterion that you can use to distinguish between uh, Muslims who can be integrated and Muslims who are, in the words of Sam Huntington, indigestible. Um, so, in talking about music, I'm going to sort of go through some of the, so just the interaction between Islam and American music. Uh, scholars in talking about the influence, the interactions between Islam and American music often begin with the blues. Sylvia and Duf, uh, a friend of a researcher based at the Schomburg Center in Harlem. She begins with the blue. She talks about the influence of West African tertil, Quranic recitation, tejweed or tertil, how that influenced the blues. So when she, she'll she play some of the earliest uh, recordings that we have of the blues, Mississippi Camp Hala, late 19th century, early 20th century recordings. And then she'll play an adhan from Mali, right? And she, 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 she tries to show the connections. I begin with jazz, not the blues. I begin in the 1920s because I'm interested in the role of music and political mobilization. I'm interested in how, especially the Garveyite movement, started drawing on Islam um, and developing its its anthems, its musical uh, musical themes, and so on. So, a word on jazz. Um, the only jazz critic I know who has noted the complex relationship, the complex links between jazz, Islam, and American expansionism and American empire is the late English historian uh, Eric Hobsbawm. Hobsbawm was obviously a distinguished Marxist theorist and writer and so on, but he was also a jazz critic on the side. And in 1959, he published a book called The Jazz Scene, where he famously compared jazz's conquest of Europe to the spread of Islam, right? And he would attribute this rapid spread to Hollywood films and to the American government's use of jazz for propaganda during the Cold War. But Hobsbawm would also write very interesting, some very interesting vignettes in his books about the role of Islam within the jazz world. Right? He was struck how in the 1950s by what he called the mass conversion to Mohammedanism, right? where you had jazz musicians in northern cities converting, and taking on Arabic or Muslim names, learning Arabic or Urdu or Farsi and so on. And he tries to be respectful. He tries to be respectful of this conversion, but ultimately he saw it as a misguided form of rebellion luring these artists away from their cultural roots in the South. So he predicted that with time and distance, these jazz men who had rejected their Southern origins for Mohammedanism would turn back to their Southern, uh, Southern roots and eventually there'd be a New Orleans jazz revival, right? There was sort of a New Orleans jazz revival with Marsalis and so on, but uh, these jazz musicians who became Muslim did not abandon, did not abandon their religious identity. The spread of Islam in American jazz circles from the 40s through the 60s turned out to be no brief uprising, but a critical part of the movement for black emancipation. Of course, this interaction between Islam and jazz begins in the 20s, as jazz musicians embraced Ahmadi Islam, a heterodox movement that, uh, that came out of 19th century India. Um, one of the earliest was Art Blakey, a drummer, band leader, who in 1947 formed a band in Harlem called The Messengers, a 17-member band of all Muslim, right? Largely Ahmadi Muslims, uh, 
centered around the Ahmadi Mosque in Harlem. Um, so the band was led by Blakey, uh, who would become Abdullah ibn Buhayna. Uh, other the musicians who were with him were trumpeter Leonard Graham, Idris Suleiman, Bill Evans, so known as Yusuf Latif, uh, who I have the honor of, of interviewing. He passed away recently, but he was very helpful in, in, in sort of telling me about the history of jazz and Islam. Uh, Ahmed Jamal, uh, Kenny Clark, uh, McCoy Tyner, the vocalist, Dakota, jazz vocalist, uh, Dakota Stanton, who went by Ali Arabia, and tenor saxophonist Lynn Hope, who took on the name of Al Hajj Abdullah Rashid Ahmed, and he would perform on stage with a turban and talk about his, his trips to Mecca and Medina and so on on stage. There are multiple reasons for conversion um, by converting uh, a minority, sort of a domestic minority, becomes part of a global majority. Uh, of, a, of a billion Muslims. The Muslim faith and languages like Arabic and Urdu opened up the cultural and political worlds of Africa and Asia, then also struggling for self-determination. But one factor that's often neglected, and I try to, I try to parse a bit, is that by adopting a Muslim identity, uh, African Americans in the US could sidestep legal racial barriers, especially down south. The trumpeter Dizzy Gillespie, he never became Muslim, he became Baha'i. And in New York to this day, there's the Dizzy Gillespie Center for Baha'i uh, Studies, I believe. Um, but he would become Baha'i, and the reason why he became Baha'i as opposed to Muslim is, is, is quite interesting. Um, I can talk about that. But anyhow, in his biography, he writes about the cultural and political work that Islam does for these, for these uh, musicians who convert. Uh, he notices that the converts who change their names and don turbans are seen as African or Middle Eastern, and they're treated better. In his memoir, To Be or Not to Bop, he talks about touring down south, right? And uh, the Muslim members of the bands were allowed to go into hotels and restaurants that the non-Muslims couldn't go into, right? Um, he said the Muslim band members could go in restaurants and bring out sandwiches for the rest. He said the Muslims were served because they were seen as foreigners. He specifically mentions a colleague, uh, drummer Kenny Clark, who was Muslim, took on the name Liaqat Salam. I believe he was the only Shia uh, in this group, the only, the only one to convert to Shiism. But on his union card, he had a W for white, right? So this is this is quite interesting. I'll return to this in a moment, just about the role of conversion and transcending or changing your racial identity. So I look at different cities in the book, European European metropolises and, uh, and American cities. And for Islam and jazz and Islam and black music in general, Philadelphia is fascinating. Um, in 1953, Ebony Magazine ran an article on Muslim jazz musicians titled Ancient religion attracts moderns, and it featured saxophonist Lynn Hope sitting on the floor at his house in Philadelphia, smoking a shisha with his two kids. They're wearing fez hats, right? This was the cover. This was the story in Ebony. So, I mean, if you go to Philadelphia today and talk to some of the, the elders in the Muslim community, I mean, there, there's so much history that needs to be written. The debate continues, for instance, about whether John Coltrane became Muslim or not. I had one gentleman tell me. So that when Coltrane arrived in Philadelphia in 1943, he became interested in Ahmadi Islam, and he would tell an inter interviewer the whole Muslim thing. It shook me, as, as, he, as he put it. And his, his entourage was largely Muslim, right? His drummer, Rashid Ali, was Muslim. His wife, Naima Grubbs, Sister Coltrane, as she was called in the community, was an observant Muslim. Yusuf Latif, who played, uh, played saxophone with um, Coltrane, claims that uh, a love supreme was influenced by the Quran. Love Supreme is actually Allah Supreme. Uh, drummer Rashid Ali would also talk about uh, Coltrane's interest in Islam. And I heard, I heard an older gentleman who said Coltrane used to go by the name of Jalaluddin, his first name, right? But again, not sure how to, to verify all of this and so on. But um, one of the people who, who helped me a lot understanding jazz history was uh, Imam Nadim Ali, who's a celebrated jazz DJ. Uh, he's a jazz DJ at Temple University for many years. He's also an imam and a musician. He has a group called the Dawa Ensemble, uh, an a cappella group. But he knew a number of these artists. Uh, so on the outside, we don't know they're Muslim, but he knew them personally. He says, Pharaoh Sanders, for example, we knew him as Abdul Mufti, right? Pharaoh Sanders. Um, one of his first albums from 1966 was called Tawheed. Likewise, George Howard, who's sort of one of the first to do smooth jazz fusion, people say Kenny G stole his style and so on. But in Philadelphia, everybody says, yeah, we knew him as Tahir, right? He was Muslim too. He grew up, I grew up with him in West Philly, says Imam Nadim. And when he died, his family buried him in a Christian cemetery because he didn't leave a will. That tends to happen to um, some of the Muslim converts who didn't leave a will. 
So, in, so that was the jazz era in the 1960s. Nation of Islam becomes popular. And you see that in the music as well. And again, in jazz, Sun Ra, right? well-known uh, jazz. Uh, jazz pioneer Sun Ra, he claimed to be, he, I don't think he ever became Muslim, but he claimed to be a distant cousin of Elijah Muhammad, uh, Muhammad, the, the founder of the Nation of Islam, and inspired by the movement's teachings. But he traveled to Cairo, and he worked with the, with the jazz community there, largely made up of African-American expats who were studying a little Azhar and working in, and, and trying to make music at the same time. But he collaborated with Egyptian drummer Salah Ragab, recording numbers such as Ramadan and Space Time. For those of you who are aware of, um, of, of San Ra's interest in space, outer space. Um, so the intermingling between Islam and African American music proceeds through the 50s and 60s uh, as R&B uh, sort of gains popularity in the 60s. You have groups, the Delphonics, the Five Stair Steps, Earth, Wind and Fire, Cool and the Gang, members of these groups would embrace Islam. And you have all kinds of motifs slipping into the music. And the ideas and tensions between Sunni and Nation of Islam would find expression in the music as well. Um, even non-Muslim artists paid homage to the Nation of Islam, um, what they saw as a positive movement that taught self-reliance. Um, Billy Paul comes to mind. Billy Paul, R&B crooner, not generally associated with Islam or, or anything like that. He was one of the first to excerpt a speech by Malcolm X um, in, in, in his songs. Uh, long before we tend to associate Malcolm X and the consciousness of Malcolm X with, with hip hop. But this began, this is 30 years earlier. Um, another figure who's very interesting in Philadelphia is Kenny Gamble. Kenny Gamble is often called the father of disco, right? He became, uh, he's produced for a number of R&B groups, uh, artists, but uh, he would become a, a Sunni Muslim named Luqman Abdul Haq. He set up Muslim Mosque United. And he needs what he leads one of the largest urban renewal projects in the country, right? Which has become a model that's being replicated in Chicago, Detroit. So the, the relationship between music, uh, urban activism, Islam, and so on is is, is fascinating. Uh, a final word on this, on the music of the '60s and '70s. As I said, the transition from Nation of Islam to Sunni Islam would be reflected in the music, uh, especially in the music of the group Kool and the Gang. Um, the two brothers who started the band, bassist Robert Krubel and saxophonist Ronald Bell, grew up in Jersey, attending Nation of Islam uh, bazaars in Newark, uh, in Jersey City. After the Bell brothers embraced Sunni Islam, the reference has changed. And one morning, after reading the surah in the Quran that celebrates life and the celebration of man, Ronald Bell wrote this track, Celebration, the famous song by Kool and the Gang, Celebration. This is one of the more delightful details uh, that I uncovered in the book. So Ronald Bell says, I interviewed him. He says, the initial idea came from the Quran. He says, I was reading the passage where God was creating Adam and the angels were celebrating and singing praises. He says, that inspired me, inspired me to write the basic chords, the line, everyone around the world, come on, celebration. You didn't know that, did you? Uh, so this song, inspired by Islam, would become an international hit heard regularly at ball games and political rallies in the US. And ironically, was played by the Reagan administration on February 7th, 1981, to welcome home hostages held by the Islamic Republic of Iran, right? So 19, early 80s, mid 80s, hip hop arrives on the scene. As many of you know, Islamic motifs, Arabic terms have threaded the fabric of hip hop since its genesis, since 1973, when Africa Bambara founded the Zulu Nation. Um, again, absorbing influences of different Islamic and quasi-Islamic ideologies and cultures that have existed in American cities for generations, for decades. In 1991, the Source magazine actually had a cover story called Islamic Summit, right, on the relationship between uh, hip hop and Islam. And um, this was also the golden era of politically conscious rap, where groups like Public Enemy and Rakim would, uh, they would sort of, they would sample not only the speeches of Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad, but also they, they sprinkled their, uh, their lyrics with all kinds of Arabic phrases, alhamdulillah, and so on. So, um, as hip hop went mainstream at about this, at, at this time, in the early, early to mid 90s, 94 to 96, as hip hop goes mainstream, these illusions were broadcast around the world, transforming cultures and identities. Through hip hop, Muslim youth would be exposed to black history, and non Muslims were introduced to Islam. I have a couple of chapters in the book on the conversion to Islam among Afro Brazilians. Favelas, Libertad, in Salvador, Sao Paulo, Rio. And many of these, these activists who are now, some of them have made Hajj, they're, they're becoming sheikhs, right? But like my political education came through rap. 
right? It's like my initial exposure to Islam came through public enemy and, and, and righteous teachers and so on. So the role of, of, of hip hop in transforming identity and sort of, again, disseminating uh, African-American Islam is critical. The relationship between Islam and hip hop is dynamic, it's multifaceted. You have people who through hip hop discover Islam and convert and then some reject music altogether. Think of rapper Outca uh, uh, Outcast, who is now no Napoleon, right? Napoleon, who was part of Tupac's crew, and now he's a Sheikh Mutaafi al Shabazz, but he doesn't do music. He's a Salafi evangelist based in Saudi Arabia, he speaks out against hip hop and so on. So you have different kinds of interactions. You have some who will be exposed to Islam through hip hop, others who will be exposed to Islam and then leave hip hop altogether. And then, of course, you have you know non, non you know kids around the world who will discover race activism through music. So I spent quite a bit of time uh, in the book looking at the burst of race activism among young Muslim Europeans and Americans over the last decade. Whether it's the Pakistani, Egyptian, and Iranian Americans leading, sort of trying to do uh, urban work coalition building in Chicago's uh, Chicago South Side, or the groups, the lobby that has emerged. Um, uh, lobby in the Census Bureau to declassify North Africans and Middle Easterners as white to give them sort of uh, minority status. Uh, but many of these young activists were politicized or became racially conscious through music. Um, again, back to the question of conversion and racial identification. Um, also interesting is that for many, for many white young hip hop fans or white uh, hip hop hoppers in the US and Europe, acceptance in the hip hop community only comes through an embrace of Islam convergence to Islam, which is seen as a rejection of being white. By becoming Muslim, in effect, an individual can transcend his or her whiteness. This is reminiscent of, again, jazz musicians who try to transcend certain racial barriers by becoming Muslim. So the white rapper Everlast, formerly Eric Schrode of House of Pain, claims that conversion to Islam allows him to visit inner city neighborhoods that he could never enter as a non-Muslim white. And his espousal, when Everlast became Muslim, Eminem called him out on it. He told him, he accused him of becoming Muslim to deny that he is a confused white rap and Irish who can't rap, right? So conversion among white rappers uh, can be contentious. Uh, worth emphasizing also is that Islam and hip hop went global at around the same time. After the first Gulf War, Islam goes global, not the, for the first time, but you see a re-globalization of Islam. Uh, the Saudis after the first Gulf War step up their efforts to export uh, Salafia, Salafism. And of course, this is when the internet enters the equation. So the globalization of hip hop and Islam converge and overlap with all kinds of cultural repercussions. One could argue that the, in the US, it was hip hop that paved the way for the rise of the Salafi movement in the mid 90s, or the Malcolm X fad of the early 90s, sparked by Afrocentrist rap and Spike Lee's film that led many young Americans to read the civil rights uh, Malcolm X's uh, autobiography and become interested in African and Islamic history. With the decline of the Nation of Islam in the mid to late 90s, these young converts gravitated, gravitated towards Salafism, which in the early 90s was being taught by Saudi-trained American-born converts. It's fascinating how Salafism, uh, somebody should write something, study this further, how Salafism gained influence in American urban centers just as the Nation of Islam declined after the Million Man March. I argue, I argue that these two movements, the Salafi movement and the Nation of Islam, are actually I have a lot in common, right? They both rather libertarian, believe in political disengagement, but also extremely entrepreneurial, extremely neoliberal. Many of these Salafi, sort of the hip hoppers turned Salafi, still talk about getting paid, right? And how getting paid is, you can, uh, you can get baraka by getting paid and, and so on. But you see this interaction between hip hop and Salafism in European and American cities. Some fascinating Salafi influences have seeped into hip hop culture. The rolled up pant legs, which you, know, which you now see, uh, Farrell, for example, sports, those kind of pants. This is the Salafis claim that the earliest Muslims wore their pants above the ankles. This is, you're seeing this as a fashion now. Uh, the fist sized beard, uh, all would become, this fist sized beard with a, with a low mustache, all would become popular within hip hop culture among youth, Muslim, and non Muslim. Uh, again, it's, it's called the Philly beard around the world, right? Because the argument is that it was Freeway, Philadelphia best rapper, Freeway, and it's in Philadelphia we have this intense interaction between Salafism and hip hop. Um, 
So it's called the Philly Beard, uh, though in Philadelphia it's just called the Sunni. Um, and there's all kinds of debates taking place ongoing around hip hop and Islam and Salafism. Not everyone is pleased with the mixing of Islam and music. Salafi preachers often speak out about against hip hop, calling it Jahidiya poetry. Uh, the young non Muslims who sport beards and roll up their pants and so on. Some of the more conservative Muslim brothers don't like it. They call them Asalama fakers. I don't know if you've heard that term. Uh, the rhetoric has died down uh, since the mid 2000s, uh, but this relationship is was was quite dynamic through the through the 90s. After 9/11, uh, this relationship changes and it begun and it begins to draw greater government scrutiny. Right after 9/11, the relationship between Islam and hip hop suddenly becomes a matter of national security. Uh, the turning point, I think, I argue, was when a young American by the name of John Walker Lint, remember John Walker Lint? Uh, young American uh, from Northern California, Marin County, found behind enemy lines, in, uh, enemy lines in Afghanistan. Just how did this, he was found October 2001, in a cave, I think. But just how did this um, middle class kid from Northern California end up joining the Taliban? So the, the counterterrorism experts did their work. And they argued that he was actually radicalized by his reading of uh, by hip hop, and hip hop actually led him to Malcolm X, to the biography of Malcolm X, and so on. Right? Um, and then after that, you begin to get government efforts, government officials talking about the need for a moderate hip hop and the need for a moderate cosmopolitan understanding of Malcolm X's autobiography. Otherwise, it can lead you towards anti-Americanism and radicalism, and so on. So you get efforts to use hip hop for diplomacy and counter radicalization. Um, which is part of the book, sort of hip hop policy. It's the part of the book that's gotten the most attention for some reason. But I just want to say that efforts to use art and music are not simply uh, there to, uh, to counter jihadi discourse, are part of a much larger initiative, and that is in some cases to reform Islam, to launch an Islamic reformation, or to promote Sufism as a liberal alternative. So just a word on the, um, on the policy debate around extremism and how it relates to music and art. Uh, the American debate on extremism and jihadist violence falls roughly into two schools of thought. <coughs> in one camp is a coalition of realists, leftists, and post-colonialists who think extremism is a response to an American policy or set of policies. And on the other side, you have liberals, liberal hawks, neoconservatives who think Islamist violence grows out of ideology and narratives and not just opposition to um, uh, American action. So from this perspective, Farid Zakaria has written quite a bit about this, that it's, it's ideology, it's not, it's not blowback. So this debate is ongoing within the government and national security community. And if the realists, the first camp, the realists and the leftists uh, advocate a less interventionist foreign policy as a way to prevent extremism, the neocons who think the roots of violence are cultural or theological are more likely to advocate some sort of social engineering uh, regime change or modernization and spend a great deal of effort studying Muslim scripture and cultural traditions to find a way to disrupt the quote-unquote narrative. So this debate about the roots of extremism is related to another policy debate, which you know, takes place in the pages of foreign policy and foreign affairs and national interest. And that is another policy debate within the, within the foreign policy community about what kind of Muslim would make a better ally for the United States, right? And it usually comes down to Islamists versus Sufis. That's sort of the the binary that you see um, in these, in these uh, studies. So the idea that Sufi Islam is more moderate and flexible and compatible with liberalism than the interpretations of Islam that come out of Arabia has an old colonial pedigree. And it found its way into American academia in the post-war years. Scholars, I would say, Bernard Lewis primarily, but you know, other, other people, W.C. Smith, H.R. Gibb, and so on. Um, I would recommend um, a book called The Mosque in Munich by Ian Johnston which talks about sort of efforts to use Sufism and so on during the early years of the Cold War, or Rosemary Hicks' uh, Columbia dissertation on uh, Sufism and Cold War liberalism. But during the early years of the Cold War, what they argue, liberal Orientalists were arguing that the US should support Sufi brotherhoods to promote modernization and democracy in South Asia, Iran, and North Africa, and to counter Arab-centric Islam. Right? One, one way to counter what's coming from Arabia and the Middle East is by stirring up local uh, local practices of Islam, local Sufi uh, uh, nationalism. Uh, the historian Bernard Lewis wrote a paper in 1953 presented at a State Department conference held at Princeton in which he called for the mobilizing of the Naqshbandi order 
in the Caucasus as a fifth column against the Soviet Union, for example. The realists, on the other hand, who are less interventionist, not really into social engineering unless it's absolutely necessary, were more concerned with order and containing the Soviet Union, and they argued for for backing Islamist groups that are seen as that were seen as more reliable, had greater institutional capacity and ability for social control. As we know, the realists won that debate. For 40 years, the U.S. would support Islamist groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi Muslim World League against communism, third world nationalism, but also argue that even domestically, what I, I try to show in the book is that even domestically, uh, U.S. policymakers would let the Muslim World League, conservative Muslim groups, set up shop in the U.S. as a way to counter African-American uh, groups, black power groups, um, and, and black Muslim organizations. But conservative Muslim groups were and are still seen as good for urban development with their self-help ethos and transnational economic ties. The idea is that conservative Muslim immigrants, conservative Muslim groups can help stabilize inner city areas. There's a very good study about this by Sally Howell, uh, who teaches at the University of Michigan. Uh, there's a study called uh, uh, competing, for, competing for Muslims, right? how different parts of Detroit want conservative Muslim groups, right? immigrants. Um, anyhow, after 9-11, as it became more evident that the Salafis were not as apolitical or pro-American as thought, Washington began looking for uh, a quote-unquote moderate Islam and would turn towards Sufism. Government agencies, leading think tanks, Naval Academy, War Academy, West Point would begin producing papers uh, and, and policy memos on how to mobilize Sufism against Salafism. Right? Rand Corporation would issue a, a major study on mobilizing moderate Muslim networks, i.e. Sufi networks. And these ideas were put into practice. Uh, both the Bush and Blair governments would begin to promote Sufism as part of a broader war on terror strategy that extended from West Africa to South Asia. In 2003, the National Security Council established a program called Muslim World Outreach of one point, with a budget of $1.3 billion aimed at, quote, transforming Islam from within. Right, by supporting organizations in Muslim countries in Europe, schools, websites, radio stations, and so on that were deemed moderate and compatible with democracy. This ideological project resembled and was in some ways modeled on the State Department's Cold War strategy of supporting opposition currents in the former Soviet Union, except the post-9-11 effort had a, had a theological agenda to reform Islamic thought and practice. Music would play a central role in this Sufi strategy, as it was called. Given the Salafi opposition to music and Sufism's use of song and even dance for worship, music after 9-11, I said this earlier, music after 9-11 came to be seen as a quick and easy way to distinguish between radical and moderate Muslim, a lifestyle criterion. And across the Muslim-majority world and Western Europe, where regimes, not just the US and Britain, have sought to mobilize Sufism, Sufi-inflected musical practices from Pakistan's Kawali to Muslim hip hop have been deployed to challenge Islamist narratives and to lure youth away from extremist discourses. So it's within this, this context, this policy context, that we should understand the State Department's music diplomacy of the last decade. Policymakers think music can convey a liberal discourse that can re-socialize at-risk Muslim youth. And it's worth thinking also on the Cold War precedents, right? This is modeled on Cold War, on the Cold War uh, culture wars. Um, in the early 50s, Soviet propaganda, some of you know, was tended to focus on American racial practices in the American South, and that Emmett Till, segregation, and so on. Um, and the U.S. wanted to counter that propaganda. So in the early 50s, both superpowers began using Islam as a political weapon. The State Department would launch its own propaganda campaign to highlight, highlight Soviet mistreatment of, Central, of Muslims in Central Asia. The Soviets, in turn, would send their Muslims to Hajj, uh, to show the wider Muslim world that Soviet Muslims are well-treated and that the Soviet Union is better on race than the U.S. So as part of the propaganda wars, uh, America, the Americans set up uh, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Europe, recruited Uzbeks, Chechens, and other Central Asian Muslims uh, to broadcast to Muslims behind the Iron Curtain. There's a wonderful book on this called The Cultural Cold War, The CIA and the World of Arts and Letters by uh, English historian Francis Stoner Saunders. And she argues that the Marshall Plan had a had a cultural arm, right? That uh, the post-war reconstruction of Europe included an elaborate cultural apparatus that was covert. So she talks about American intelligence uh, 
setting up journals such as uh, Encounter, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, and the concerts and films that it sponsored. And American intelligence even supported the Arabic Review and Majella, an anti-communist magazine based in, uh, based in Munich, and organized an Arabic literary conference uh, in Rome in 1961. The war on terror in Western Europe today also has a cultural side. And while more discreet than covert and often implemented through partnerships with local NGOs, the current cultural offensive is underpinned by a Cold War framework, namely the idea, the notion that the war on terror is a battle of ideas and ideologies, and the belief that flow of information, free flow of information, can defeat jihadist ideology. Um, as part of the, the cultural Cold War, uh, music was central to the cultural Cold War, and particularly jazz. Right? Um, the State Department would send these integrated jazz bands led by the likes of Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong to show the non-aligned world, the developing world, the, the post-colonial world that America was making progress in democracy and that jazz represents, that America was making progress in race and that jazz in some ways represents uh, democracy. Uh, so jazz was central to Cold War diplomacy. Willis Conover would broadcast his show, Jazz Hour, um, uh, from a, a VOA relay station um, in Tangier, Morocco. So they broadcast behind the Iron Curtain. And of course, there were, so these jazz tours um, are, are now a subject of, of great interest. A number of books have come out on the jazz tours, right? Can we revive the jazz tours? Um, so the historians and musicologists who've been writing about this have largely concluded that the jazz, jazz diplomacy was, in a, was an unmitigated success. Right. If you look at um, some of the books that have come out, um, I'm not sure these tours brought down the Soviet Union, right? As Quincy Jones has argued, and so on. But I do think their cultural impact was quite extraordinary, and I try to to talk about this in the book. As a result of these tours, you get some amazing collaborations. You get Duke Ellington, uh, who would compose the record Far East Suite after his 1963 1963 tour of Iran, Afghanistan, and India. Uh, the album includes a well-known number, Isfahan. And there's an interview from the early 70s on, on the BBC's website about sort of his, his observations of traveling and, and performing in Kabul, actually. So these jazz ambassadors met with and mentored young musicians during their travels. Randy Weston would settle in Morocco, take an interest in, in Gnawa music, and create all kinds of new musical fusions. Dave Brubeck would mentor generations of Turkish, a generation of Turkish musicians, Quincy Jones in Egypt, and so forth. Uh, the jazz tours are deemed to have been so successful that they were revived after 9-11, directed in Muslim communities in Europe and elsewhere, but this time again mostly hip-hop. American state officials are aware of the appeal of black music and the African-American experience among young Muslims. And I must emphasize that the music diplomacy program fits into a much larger effort by American diplomacy to showcase the civil rights movement and black freedom struggles starting with the experience of African uh, Muslim slaves in the, in the South. So films like Prince Among Slaves about Ibrahim Abdurrahman, an African Muslim prince who ended up a slave in Mississippi, are screened at embassies in Europe and the Middle East and Africa. The 19th, the actual, uh, the, the, the actual narratives of Muslim, of Muslim slaves from the South written in Arabic on parchment, right? Like they're also being shown at different uh, diplomatic outposts. Diversity, post-racialism, and the civil rights movement seems to be the idiom of late American hegemony. Um, to wrap up, let me say a word about efforts American and European to promote Sufism in, 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 um, in Europe. Um, Britain's most well-known Muslim uh, organization is the long-established Muslim Council of Britain. In the mid-2000s, the, uh, the Blair government broke relations with the, uh, with the MCB. They were deemed uncooperative, partly because of what they said about the 2006 Israel-Lebanon war and so on. And Downing Street then began to empower Sufi leaders to counter Islamist influence, fund, influence funding various organizations, including the Muslim Sufi Council and the Quilliam Foundation, the counterterrorism think tank. The British government also set up a preventing violent extremism program and organized a roadshow of British and American Sufi scholars who traveled around the world, uh, around Britain, speaking to young Muslims. The newly founded Sufi organizations like Quilliam and the Muslim Sufi Council try to offer a counter narrative that rejects Salafism. They're close to Washington, openly backed by the State Department. The Sufi, the Burr Sufi Council spiritual head, Sheikh Kabani of the Naqshbandi Haqqani Order, 
uh, consulted with President Bush after 9-11 and spoke at the Nixon Center and so on on the political potential of Sufism. Some other American clerics with Sufi leanings like Noah Keller would fly to London to, uh, to present an alternative Islam. Music and music's role in the public sphere were from the, was from the start a key component of the Sufi counteroffensive. Music featured prominently at the Sufi councils, public events, and so on, and again, hip hop played a role. Um, as those of you who are studying Islamic history, Middle East history know, uh, this, this policy of mobilizing Sufi against Salafis is problematic for very reasons. The distinction between Sufi and Salafi and Islamist is not so clear cut. So called Islamists often engage in the same Sufi practices. Um, the idea that Sufis are peaceful or pacifists is belied by a quick reading of North and West African political history colonial history, the likes of Usman Danfodio and Mohammed Sanusi come to mind, Sufi leaders who fought colonialism. I want to conclude by drawing your attention to a study published in late 2014 produced by NATO on violent extremism, and it assesses efforts to use Sufism against Salafism in Morocco, Egypt, the US, the UK, and Israel. In my book, I talk about UK, US, Morocco, and Pakistan, but I was not aware that Israel has, has tried to mobilize Sufism as well. But the NATO study argues that aside from Morocco, where the regime was able to co-opt the massive Gucci Shia order and get them to mobilize votes during elections, this strategy, this strategy has largely failed, A, because the Sufi tarikhas, the Turok, tend to be small, they don't have the capacity of political parties, and B, Sufi strategy tends to be top-down, and they give examples of how the UK created the British Sufi Council overnight with little grassroots support, hoping that could de-radicalize um, uh, youth and um, Muslim youth in Britain. They also give the example of how the U.S. tried to cultivate Imam Faisal Abu Rauf as a moderate leader. Some of you will remember the 2010, the, so, the controversy about so-called mosque at Ground Zero. Um, and Governor Patterson came out in support on CBS television in support of Imam Faisal. And he said, the group who has put this mosque together, they are known as Sufi Muslims. They are not like the Shiites. They're almost, they're almost like a hybrid, almost westernized. Anyhow, this study is worth looking at. I was surprised that this study doesn't look at, uh, discuss the role of the US government in its relationship with Gulen, because after 2000 and 2003, Gulen came to be seen as a very positive pro civic engagement kind of Islam. Um, I was going to read a couple of passages. Do we have time? Yes, no, no. Keeper of the keeper. So we have, all right, so we have 40 minutes. <laughs> Okay, so let me read. Uh, let me read just a couple of pieces. Um, I'll, let me. I haven't spoken about South America much. Um, I think for people who study Islam, Islam in the West, I, I, I do think that we neglect Latin America. Um, Latin America is very interesting. The Muslim experience in Latin America is interesting. Um, if you look at Muslim communities in Europe and America, they tend to be inserted between sort of surveillance states state that are pursuing all kinds of war and terror policies harassing these communities and right-wing xenophobic movements um, like the Front National in France or the Tea Party here. In Latin America you don't have that, right? You don't have that type of, of state persecution or organized hostility uh, towards Muslim communities and so Muslim communities in Latin America are, are quite comfortable and uh, people I, I, mean, I was uh, interviewing uh, would often talk about this. They're saying actually Latin America is an entirely different discourse, and I was and I was in Mexico and Brazil doing dissertation research in the early 2000s, and the discourse, public discourse, is quite strikingly different. Anyhow, I have a couple of chapters on uh, sort of the history of Islam among uh, in, in Latin America, from the slaves to the early migration from the Middle East, and I talk about pop cultural appropriations of um, of the East, sort of Brazilian Orientalism, and um, I contrast the carnival of Rio with the carnival of Salvador de Bahia in the north. Um, so what's happening in northern Brazil is you're getting Afro-Brazilians, um, activists getting an interest in Islam, getting an interest in the history of, of Islam among, among Brazilian slaves, particularly in the uprising of 1835, the Malay uprising, which was one of the most, was unsuccessful, but one of, could have been the biggest, one of the biggest uprisings, slave revolts. Anyhow. Um, Pelourinho, as Salvador's historic center is called, is dazzling in the summer twilight. A cluster of low colonial buildings overlooks the clear water of the Bay of Bahia. The cobblestone lanes are lit by hanging street lamps. The pastel-colored stucco townhouses and Baroque church facades beam with history. 
As banners of African masks flutter in the wind, the sound of trombones and trumpets grow louder. Carnival in Salvador's old city is a quiet affair compared to Rio or Sao Paulo. The procession tries to replicate an earlier era. Brass bands stroll through the alleyways, teenagers pound drums tied around their waist. Young girls with white bandanas carry effigies of different orishas, African gods disguised as Catholic saints. No floats or saint, no floats or trucks are allowed into the historic area. Also absent is the near naked Samba Queen. The female protagonist in this carnival is the Bahian woman with her distinctive head wrap and white hoop skirt, which is said to be a Muslim influence. Whether walking with the procession selling water, food, Bayana dolls, or teaching tourists how to wrap the radia around their heads, the turban, the Bayana, which with the embroidered dress covering up her body, is a ubiquitous presence in Northeast Brazil. And Gilberto Freire, not surprisingly, the, the father of Brazilian nationalism, not surprisingly, saw the Bayana as an important symbol of Moorish, Islamic, and African influence. Um, also about Brazil, this is a, this is a movement in uh, uh, San Bernardo do Campo, which is in the periphery of Sao Paulo. I'm just talking about the narrative that's emerging uh, among Afro-Brazilian Muslims. Sugar has a bittersweet meaning in this community. In the fairy narrative, sugar epitomizes the oriental sensuality of the Brazilian plantation. For these young converts, sugar is linked to the Orient, but in a different way. Azúcar was the essence of plantation slavery, but it's also what connects them to history and the wider world. They speak excitedly about how sugar was the handmaiden of Islam, that it was Muslim conquerors in Persia who brought the crop to the Western Mediterranean and Iberia. Right? Talking to these young men, I recall the words of Orestes Fonseca, the Imam of Havana, Cuba, who tells his congregation, every time we hear Cubans proudly say, I'm as Cuban as the sugar cane, tan cubano como la caña, we Muslims should smile because sugar cane is not Cuban, it's Arab, it came from the Middle East, to Andalusia and to the Caribbean. One more little paragraph. Uh, the concluding chapters of the book are about uh, Muslim-Jewish tensions in France um, and the debate around uh, Judeo-Arabic music, which is the music of North African Jews, and how, who does this music belong to, who owns this music, and um, can it be used, as some liberal Muslims argue, can it be used for deep radicalization and, and sort of more community understanding. But I'm going to read a bit about the scene that emerged after the displacement of Algerian Jews in 1962 to France. The golden age of Judeo-Arabic music is said to have been born. Hundreds of thousands of Pianois boarded ships and headed for French cities. The Algerian musicians who ended up in Paris, uh, Lili Abbasi, Medioni, Cherki, Blanc Blanc, Venet, began to congregate, congregate regularly at Le Poussin Bleu, a restaurant on the rue du Faubourg Montmartre, right across from the Folie Berger. Today it's a kosher deli. We were all looking for each other. And we found each other at Le Poussin Bleu, says, music, says pianist Maurice Meduni. Le Poussin provided an escape from the joblessness and hostility they faced on a daily basis. The musicians gathered around the violinist Lili Abbasi, then in his late 60s. Medioni on piano, Blanc Blanc banging the tambourines, Cherki on, on guitar, Renette on oud, and Samuel Magribi shaking the maracas and singing. The group had all night sessions that they still smile about. Soon a hauntingly beautiful music of exile began to emerge. On his piano, Medioni composed songs about Wahran's alleyways and Paris's despondent skies and gave them to Lee Monti to perform. Three sentiments would recur in the songs, exile, separation, and nostalgia. The composition that would come to encapsulate this uprooted community's fall from grace was Anna Lurka, I Am Relief, a memorable tango by Lili Bunish. I used to flutter on the highest branches and now I've fallen, sang Bunish in quavering Arabic. In this song and others like it, Bonish moved from moved from an Argentine tango to an Andalusian nuba, keeping the same mournful, mournful tone. I am the poor forgotten leaf, dry and confused. Winds push me from place to place. I'll stop there. Thank you all.